they're kind of like a community group outside of WA. Uh, interesting to see we don't have too many businesses, um, and I kind of expected that. Um, so we're also going to talk about how to make money and a couple other things that would apply to everyone. So the first thing I wanted to do today is um, convince you to run an event for your business or your organisation. I think events are a really important part of business and can be a really good thing to do in any organisation. And I'll tell you why in a second. I want to equip you with the framework, um, the list of things that you need to do, um, and give you some examples, some documents, some fancy questions for how to run those events. And then I just want to answer your questions because everything that I talk about today um, won't be able to cover everything. So I want to hear what you guys specifically want to know in your groups. Alright. <coughs> grab some water soon. <coughs> and that's an example of how good my uh, slide animations are. The title came up after this. Alright, to do this, I will. Well, A, I'm going to tell you why you want to run events. And I'm going to go through that in terms of like kind of the benefits of events. That leads to point two. Show you what you should be aiming for. The key aims of any of them, and this goes for all different types of organisations. I tried to make it really general so that it fits into everyone. Um, we're talking about the general aims, and the important part is that it's in planning and review. So you need to have these things in mind at all times. And as I'll say many times today, it's good to write them down. Three, um, how. I want to give you the framework that you need to use, the list of to-dos is practically what that is, and then I want to answer your questions. And I've tried to split it into like, I'm going to start with why, then we're going to go into what it actually is, then we're going to go into your hows, um, and your who, where, where, what. Good, the title comes up after you. <laughs> Nothing comes up after you. <laughs> Alright, yep, so I need to give you some caveats, um, which are little warnings. My aim is for this to be as practically useful for everyone, but obviously, like I've said, I need to address a lot of general things in this talk, so things that apply to everyone, and I assume that everyone wants it to be as useful for them, which is practical, so I'll need to address a lot of practical things as well. Also, because there are different groups, there are going to be different types of events that I'll need to be talking about at the same time, and different practicals are going to be different types of events. So really, it's up to you, not me, to apply this to your organisation. This talk will try and be general, then I'll try and give you as much specific but you need to apply it, you need to keep that in mind for this talk. It's a huge topic, there's a lot of content, I only have like an hour, I really only want to talk for like half an hour of that, um, and then answer your questions because I can't talk much. Um, and these slides and stuff will be available, so you don't need to kind of like write stuff down even or try and remember everything, it's going to be a lot of information on some of these slides. Um, and I've included stuff that'll be useful for later on, like links to a Google Drive that I've made where I've uploaded heaps of example documents and stuff like that. So it'd be good for you to get a copy of this slide and uh, maybe even watch it again later on. But um, another big thing I want to say before we even get started is that if you've got any questions that are going to take too long right now or even after this session, then make sure you get in contact with me. These guys will give you my contact details, I'll talk to everyone afterwards. So if you have like burning questions or want to go into anything in depth, then you can talk to me. So, that first question, why you should run events. The first question you probably want to ask yourself before you even do that is what is an event? And this is kind of like the most general thing that applies to everyone. Really, an event is a gathering of people. That's basically what it is. And it can be a gathering of people in person, online, in some community or another. Fundamentally, it's a gathering of people. So that just gives you the context. Now, why do we run events? We run events for pretty much this reason. It comes down to this in its most general form. To build, involve, and influence your target audience. So the things you'd be doing with your business obviously have a target audience for your organisation. You want to influence a certain group of people. Events are a really good way of getting people together, communicating, etc. and you'll see why later, um, to actually be able to give you a, an opportunity to get shit into their life. So basically to involve them, so get them stuck to you, build your brand, and then influence them. Because at events you can do things with people, make them excited, etc. So how does that work? Oh yeah, the other one, to make money. And they work, so we should do them. Do I need to, yeah, so this is a question that come to, came up in my mind when I first started running events. It's do I need to be popular or especially talented or experienced to run successful events? And uh, if you look in the events industry, I think it's pretty clear, no, there are a lot of people who aren't. What you need to be is just methodical, you need to be careful, and you need to be mindful. Methodical means doing the things that I'm gonna talk about today. Careful is a mindset. You need to be making sure that you're always thinking about what you're doing um, and never taking too huge risks. And mindful means um, review, basically. 
So you need to follow steps and like write things down. You need to be careful, so don't take huge risks or do anything silly. Think about what you what people are seeing from you, and uh, also be mindful. So just keep the whole process in mind while you're doing it. And then if you if you do those things, then I guarantee that your popularity, experience, and talent will increase as you go along. All right. Title comes up second. Good. This is the key objectives of any event. And um, I'm sorry that they come up all at once. It didn't, didn't get to the slide. So, firstly, you want to build awareness of your brand. These are the things that you want to have in mind or have written down somewhere the whole time. You want to build awareness of your brand. That's pretty simple. That just means telling people you exist. And when you run an event, you are telling people you exist. You're inviting them to the event or telling them, I have this event. Come along. So that's really simple. There's nothing more. In, you want to instill an impression of demand in your brand. So that's called the herd effect. Basically, one thing that we do when we run events is sell tickets, or we try to get people to come. And if we're going to sell tickets and make people come, then they need to think that there are other people who have come. No one wants to go to something where there's no one else. So you're trying to not trick people, you're trying to create a like community of demand. So if you've ever seen like a club night say, hey, we've already sold out, like come next time, that kind of thing. It's an example of building a community of demand, so like making your brand seem like something that people want. So that's again, that's really simple, that's just creating a herd effect. You want to make personal connections, and this is important to say that it's expected and unexpected. You want to build par partnerships with other groups, say if you're putting on an event, and again, these are things to keep in mind later on, you'll see how they actually work. There'll be um, examples. You want to build connections between yourself and other brands, so that might be businesses that you involve in your event, um, other people that you get to sponsor it, etc., etc., but also between yourself and people, and between people and people, because an event is a gathering of people. You want to make connections that last, and they're expected and unexpected. So what does that mean? So expected connections, obviously, the people you invite. The good thing about events is that very often you'll meet people, or people will meet people that they don't expect to meet, and things come out of that. Um, for example, at the Bloom launch a couple of weeks here, a really good example that I'll be referring to after today. Um, that was the launch event for this whole group. Um, there were lots of people here who had never met each other, and I'm sure, like even myself, I met the director of Space Cube and a couple other people like that. You don't expect to meet these people, but at events, that then associates with your brand. It's a really good thing to make connections. So that's the third thing you should be aiming for. The fourth, inform potential customers how to be involved in your business. Basically, this is getting them invested. And the most basic way that this happens is that they come to your event. They've given you some of their time, so they're invested they're invested in your brand, and they want to have involvement. And then that flows into the next one, connect individuals into an independent community of sharing discussion. So Coca-Cola and other big brands like that aren't successful because they're really good at giving people messages. They're really successful because people take on those messages and it forms an independent community of demand. So you're basically wanting to build hype with your events, and that means showing that there's demand, um, making people excited about being at the event, making people excited about what your business or your organization does. So this is another aim. Then you want to make money. More importantly, the way that I think about it is you don't want to lose money. Most of us here today aren't really aiming to make money out of our events, but I will talk about how to do that. Um, you really need to be budgeting not to lose money. The point of events is more, unless you're an event management business trying to make money, the point of events is really to do the other things. Build awareness, create demand, etc., etc. So keep it in mind. Another thing that people don't really think about um, and actually screws a lot of people over is you need to be aiming to avoid negative results. So this is things like harm minimization, risk management, we'll go through a bit later. But think about it, some events actually do a lot more harm to the business or the organization that runs them than good. Some events where there's no one at them can ruin a club, can ruin um, any, any kind of business. And the way that you deal with that is to just identify and mitigate the risks. And we'll talk about what control exposure means. So I'm going to go over those um, points after I talk about the framework now um, in relation to the Bloom launch event and the EMS event, which is something I've had a lot before. All right, these are the steps. There's the title. So this is the framework. We're getting through it pretty quickly because I really want to have zero emotion. First step, and I think it's about 12. So these are the things that you should definitely take on board from today and apply. First step that you need to do is write a mission statement. 
Now, no one thinks about doing this. They all think, okay, I'm gonna run an event, they talk about it, they come to some conclusion. No one ever writes it down, and I think that's really silly. It's something that's helped me every time I've run an event. If you write down what you wanna do, then you can keep referring back to it, and it grows over time. You need to keep that somewhere that you're gonna be finding and interacting with it often. Um, and as part of that mission statement, you should keep these things in mind. Do less, but do it better. And that's about having three points, maybe. Three things that you want to achieve out of running your event. What type of event? Well, that comes from your mission statement. So you shouldn't really be sitting down and saying, I want to run this type of event. You should be thinking and running down, what do I want to achieve? And then the type of event comes out of that. Again, front of the Second thing that you need to do, this is definite one that you actually need to dedicate conscious time to, you need to research. So who else is doing this kind of thing? Who else is trying to achieve this kind of thing? Who else is aiming for the same target audience I'm looking at? Most of us here won't have experience running events. I know I didn't, and um, in terms of some events, I still don't. What you need to do is find out what other people have done and give yourself the content that you need to work with. What have other people had success with is another big point to do research on. So look at businesses that you have been influenced by or organizations that you have been influenced by and your decisions that you're doing what you're doing. Have a look at their Facebook page, have a look at their website, have a look at some articles about their past events, have a look at how they portray themselves, their branding, etc. It sounds common sense, and a lot of these will, but it's something you need to actually sit down and say, have I done that yet? It's a question up back. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, the next thing is just the fun event, and these are the obvious ones. So what type of event, what's going to be the title, and then what, what comes into those, so how best to involve and influence my audience? So you don't want to be having a cocktail night or a ball if you're trying to like launch a product or you're trying to, um, you don't want to be having like a club night if you're trying to run like a professional organization. Very simple, how are you going to influence your audience? What are you going to call your event? You're not going to call, if you're having like a ball, you're not going to call it like the mega break. I'm trying to keep it simple. Alrighty, um, you need to figure out the date, you need to figure out the venue, and um, obviously the considerations that come in when you're talking about the venue or the vibe. So, again, you don't want to be holding um, product launch in a nightclub, most likely, etc. Um, the price is something you should always keep in mind with venues, and another important one what will they not let you do? What will they not let you do in venue? So, if you hold something at Windsor Hall, there are an awful lot of things that they won't let you do. Will they conflict those things that you can't do with what you're trying to do? That's a question you need to actually think about. All right, here's where you're getting to the meat. The fourth thing, and these are things that you actually need to consciously do, and they need to have written elements to them. You need to build partnerships, support groups, team, staff, contributors, sponsors. So this is about building a list of people that you're gonna be involved with and are gonna be involved with running your event. So that's something that you need to think about right from the get-go, that's why it's point four. Because if you don't have the people to do something, you shouldn't be bothered doing it. If you don't have an idea of what you need to complete your event, the resources, the human capital, then you're not going to be successful with running your event. So each of those things mean a different thing. So partnerships are obviously, who am I going to put the event on with? Who's going to combine with me? Like, if you're running with Red Frogs, for example, at your event, they are really good at um, supporting like alcohol management and getting people happy and things like that. Partnerships are one thing you need to say, who am I going to do that with? Support groups, and that's a personal thing. Do you have the ability to run an event? Events are stressful. Events take up a lot of time. Are your family going to be able to give you help during your event? Are you going to have some friends who will be able to like pick things up for you if you're super stressed out or you don't have time? It's another thing you actually need to consciously acknowledge and probably write down. You need to have a team or staffing, and those things are pretty obvious, but you do need to write that down from the beginning and maintain the list. Um, and you need contributors and sponsors. Not every event needs contributors. That's kind of like, are you going to have speakers? Are you going to have people donate things? Are you going to have sponsors that give you money? Or turn up at your event and sell an auction? That kind of thing. All right, so the next written point, point five, regulatory plan. I know there's a lot on the board. But basically, a regulatory plan is saying, what do I need to do that will get me the allowance to do the event? So regulations come from a lot of different sources. Um, and it also involves um, people who don't have formal requirements for approval of your event. So we call these people stakeholders. Um, basically, they're people or organizations that have either an interest or a risk associated with the running of your event. So when EMAS runs its events on UWA, a good example of the stakeholders would be UWA. 
and there's a couple of different groups in UWA. Um, there's the guild, there's venues management, facilities management, there's the promotional people who want to have an approval on whether your event's going to reflect badly in UWA. Then there's other stakeholders. You have the super council, you have the government departments like liquor licensing, the gambling people as well. Um, and then there's, there's all kinds of groups. Stakeholders can mean a lot of different people. It can mean you as well. But it's very important to write out a list of who the stakeholders are and know your obligations to them. And another funny point is um, if you're running a raffle, then technically, yes, you should be getting a license for, um, from the IGL department for raising a hand in the running a raffle this game. Do you have any venue restrictions? The venue or another important stakeholder? What paperwork is required when it's due? That's basically what it comes down to. What paperwork is required? What do you need to fill out? When's it due? And then it comes into the calendar later on. The sixth thing you need to do. You need to do a promotion plan. So who here has like run an event recently? Okay, what event did you run? Eagles Pop Crawl. Okay, that's a good event. And uh, how did you promote that? Oh, I did. Okay. <clears throat> Do you know if there was um, like a set list of things that were written down? Has anyone been involved in the promotion of events? Sorry. <laughs> okay, someone that I don't know. What event did you run? Um, it was a, uh, a charter night dinner for our road track club. I can't hear anything, sorry. It's a charter night dinner for our road track club. Okay, and uh, how did you promote your event? Uh, multiple means. Uh, we contacted the road track club by email because it's mostly older people there. The other road track club members uh, from the uh, clubs around we contacted by uh, Facebook for the most part. Okay. Uh, we got them all to go through Eventbrite and purchase their tickets. Okay, yep. Alright, I can thank you for that. I can basically see what you're saying. So a promotion plan is something that you consciously sit down and write out and say these are the things that I'm going to do to promote my event. So for example, you sent an email to the other road track clubs, you made personal connection with the other road track clubs as well, aside from the emails. What you would do in a promotional plan is write down the list of things you need to do and identify them. The important thing to note is that successful events require something to be written down. If you think that giant festivals happen or even like little art gallery shows for community groups happen without someone saying consciously and writing at least to someone else, how am I going to promote this? How am I going to get people to come? They don't happen without that. So you need a conscious plan. And that plan doesn't just include before the event, getting people to come. Another thing that no one thinks about, it needs to include what you're going to do after. Because if you think about the key aims that we were talking about, <coughs> one of them was to build and maintain hype. And if you're going to be promoting just before your event, and then no one talks about it afterwards because you're not stimulating that conversation, then you're not going to be capitalizing on all the hard work you've done. So a promotional plan is a plan for before and after your event, and it's a list. Now these are the kind of things that you need to be considering and again I invite you to come back to these slides and read them um, because you can pick these up when you're actually using it and that's the there. You're going to have promotional media, so that means things like photos, um, videos, slides that you might go speak at a lecture with, that kind of thing. You need to actually say what are the things that I need to get created. You need to consider that you need graphic design and as I'll say in my frequently asked questions at the end, you shouldn't be doing that yourself unless you know and other people have told you that you're good at it. Because a lot of a lot of people, very, very silly decisions can be made in terms of I'll do it. And it's something that I've done myself, it's a mistake. The first company that I set up, I made the logo of Microsoft Paint. <laughs> it, was, it was very good. Um, but yeah, people were telling me for about a year after that, this is disgusting. <laughs> and it was reflecting really badly. And I at the time was like, oh, I think I can draw and stuff like that, it's fine. But you need to actually think, do I have these skills? And if you don't, then it's about getting someone else to do it for you. You need photography and videography. Um, and I'll give you a list of my preferred suppliers at the end. Um, Facebook events, obviously, one thing you need to consider. Posts on other social media. So there was a good talk here a couple of weeks ago from Nicola Willis, who runs Times Square Glamour. She talked a lot about not just Facebook, because Facebook used to be where it was at. But now, these days, it's also Snapchat, you know, Instagram. And you've got a lot of other things that you can put your into. Can everyone still hear me? Down the back, yeah? Okay, cool. <coughs> now, a promotional plan isn't just a list of things, and it's not just a calendar of when you're going to do them. It's actually a set of targets. So if you're not meeting your targets, your key performance indicators, if you're having a serious business, then there's no point really putting in the effort. You need to be aiming for something before you go out and figure out what you need to do. 
So a target for an event like Bloom would be to get a good cross section of the UWA community to be involved in the event. It would be to get a good amount of their target audience to know. And it's about, and for EMAS it's similar. You know, you'd be talking about, I want to get a certain amount of my target audience involved. I want to sell this many tickets. It, it's really difficult to say what your target push should be in a general sense for any event, but they're, they're pretty obvious things. It's just that you actually need to put it into the promotional plan. When do I want to have this many tickets sold? When do I want to have this many people who know about the event? When do I want to have my staff list built up so that those people can sell tickets for me and promote for me? Those are some kind of examples of it, but obviously, like I said at the beginning, you need to apply this to what you're doing. So targets are definitely something you need to put in there. And again, keep in mind that all of these things that you do for this promotional plan are to build that herd mentality. They're about creating the herd effect, so they make people think, okay, that this is something that's in demand, and I want to be a part of it, I'm going to demand it myself. <coughs> A good point to note is that, especially if you're inexperienced, um, it's it's also not about bragging. Uh, a problem that a lot of um, people in the music industry have is um, saying, oh my god, we've almost sold out, and they say that for like 13 weeks straight, and then people get the feeling that it's also just them being bragging. Second, I mean seven. So you've got your delegation and your outsourcing plan. Now, this is a good one that Susan actually brought up when we were talking about this, um, because it's something that when you're involved in the events industry, you don't think you actually need to go and write down. Once you've got the experience, you know people. You will go to those people instantaneously and say, I need this from you kind of thing. But if you're getting into this and you're just starting out, you need to have a plan for how you're going to do the things that you cannot do. So what can't you do really well by yourself? It's not just what can't you do by yourself. It's what can't you do really well by yourself. So if you think that you're not going to be tip top at putting up decorations nicely, I can say that about myself, then you need to have a plan for how you're going to get that done. And that means as part of your staffing list, as part of your delegation list, but also you need to have a list of contractors that you're going to contact. Again, I'll give you my list of preferred suppliers at the end. Um, and you need to be researching that, like I'll say later, and you need to be in a team delegation list. So if you're running a UWA club, it's the same as if you're working in a business. If you're gonna sit down and run an event, you're not gonna be able to do everything necessarily. Sometimes you can if it's a small event. You need to write out whose responsibilities are what and then maintain contact. So again, this is one of the things that people don't really write down, but it's really important to have it written down from the very start. Who am I gonna give the jobs to? Who are the people that I'm gonna involve? The contractors or etc. that are outside to do things really well for my event. So it needs to be written down. Hey, pretty boring. Your costing, your funding, your income projection. So who here actually has experience with running events in an accounting sense? Who here has done the budgets for events before? Okay, we have probably like 10 to 70 people in the room. Yeah, all right. Everyone thinks that there's some magic to this when you run an event. Everyone thinks that you can't make money, you can't not lose money, or there's things, things that you don't know you should have studied accounting. When you're running an event, it's pretty simple. You don't want to lose money, you just need to know what you're spending and what you earn. And that comes down to an Excel spreadsheet. I'm not gonna tell you too much today about how budget. I will give you a good example budget that I made up um, like last week and the Google Drive is up there. But basically, it's not something there's anything special to know. It's just about being methodical, careful, and mindful. So methodical, putting everything in there, making sure you do record the receipts so that you know exactly how much you spent. Methodical means, so careful means, say, income projection. What's my worst case and my best case scenario? So if I don't sell this many tickets, am I gonna lose money? What do I need to do to avoid losing money? So, there's nothing special for you to know. You just need to use common sense and you need to have some okay Excel skills. And then you need to be really methodical about making sure you update things, really careful about how you consider every time you spend money, is this what I need to be doing? And I'm gonna talk about more of that more later, so I'll leave that for now. Next. Why? Oh, good. All right, now this is the last slide, so I know it's getting tiresome. The eighth thing, and um, to be honest, probably the most important thing, um, is that you need an overall timeline. Because the biggest problem that people run into when they've not organized events before and not run events before is that they don't know when they need to do things. It's not doing the things. A lot of things that you do when you run an event, like a budget, are things that just take a lot of common sense, and they just need you. Careful, 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 careful. But 
if you're going to do it in the right amount of time and you're going to do it well, then you need to have an actual conscious like calendar with the deadlines, the key things you need to do, um, and just all of the key targets that you need to have met from your promotional plan. So everything that came into this talk before point eight needs to be a part of that calendar. And again, it's common sense about what needs to be included, but it's really important that you need a calendar. And it needs to be written, and it needs to be a month by month calendar. I've seen people use like week by week ones. The reason a month by month one is that even if you're running an event in like six weeks, you need to see what else is on kind of thing in your life. You need to have a good appreciation of what each week is doing to build up to the next week. So like if you're doing a promotional plan and you want to sell 100 tickets by the end of week one, that is important at the end of week two. Unless if you don't remember that you need to have done one thing before you've done it another, having a month calendar that you look at both at the same time and say, all right, that's how it fits into the context of my plan. Another really big point that I'll say a couple of times, um, when you're running events, excuse that shit happens, Things will happen all the time you don't expect, you don't understand. People that you speak to will tell you that there are things you haven't done yet. The regulatory plan always goes out the window. It's, it's almost guaranteed. So what you need to do is you need to give yourself buffer time for everything. So you're kind of setting your calendar as like a realistic expectation of what you can get done. But when there's a deadline for the putting in of a paperwork, don't put the deadline on your calendar as the day of the thing. When you want people to submit uh, contributions for, I don't know, donations to your events, don't put the actual deadline on that calendar um, for what you're telling them kind of thing. You need to give yourself time between when things need to be actually done or everything will go to crap completely and when you want to have aimed to have it done. And that needs to be a realistic time that you're aiming to have it done, but then you're giving yourself the time for things that you're not prepared to happen to happen because they happen all the time. All right. Um, I'll talk more about that in the regular session. So, risk management. Um, something that people who don't have experience at events don't know, so this is an, another one for you that need to research. Firstly, are you insured if you're a university club or like an organisation with more often than not if you're working within a group that is already insured? Um, but it's a good important question to ask. Does someone else hold the risk entirely? A lot of people assume that other people hold the risk entirely, so I thought I'd make the point that it's almost always no. If you're hiring an electrical contractor and they're setting up the electrics for you and then someone dies from an electrical shock, think about that. Is that their fault? Well, maybe they might get sued if they were seriously negligent, but you're the person who has the event, the venue, who promoted it. It not only will reflect really bad on you, but the risk of you being sued and things like that is also significantly high. So when you're doing risk management, you need to be thinking about all the risks and you need to be thinking about how you're going to manage all of the risks. And it's more than just saying someone else's problem. Alright, um, there are different types of risks and you need to think consciously of, and when you write this plan down, again, all of these things are written, none of them are just things you need to think about. You need to be saying, what are the different types of risks? So examples of that are, are there physical risks to do with the venue? Are there promotional risks with how my, or publicity risks with how my business is going to look after this? Are there um, risks and things that you can't control, like transport to the venue being screwed up if there's really bad traffic, how are you going to manage that kind of thing? So the point is that there are lots of different risks, and again, this is something that's different for every event. Um, so you just need to be thinking about the different types that apply to you, and then write them down, and then what you do from there is you figure out how severe are each of the sub-risks going to be. We have a thing called a risk management plan, um, which I think almost every organisation uses in some form or another. Um, a risk management plan is basically this. It's got headings, different types of risks, and then it's got, there's actual risks, so like someone falling over and getting electrocuted on a cable. And then it's got the severity, because the severity impacts a lot. You actually need to write, it sounds silly, but you actually need to write down how severe each risk is, because the severity has a real big Im impact on what you're gonna do about the risk, how seriously you need to take the actions that you're gonna do to mitigate the risk. So your action plan is based off what are the risks, how severe are they, and how likely are they gonna happen, and then what am I gonna do? How much time and resources and thinking am I gonna put into actually mitigating that risk? So this is a written thing, and I can give you an example of the risk management plan in the Uber I think that I made later. And if you can't kill it, mitigate it. Not every risk is gonna be able to get rid of, got rid of. So your event getting rained out, 
you don't give me up a higher 20 grand mark key, just say that's the case. Um, then all you can really do is try to mitigate the risk by saying, all right, well, in, in that case, we might have to move the site. And that's as simple as asking the next door venue, hey, is there a possibility that at the last minute we could find the space out or something like that? This is an example of something you can do that will save you potentially a lot of time, a lot of those publicity risks, and just make your life a lot easier if you know, all right, this is what I'm going to do if these things go wrong. It's really important to write this down really important to keep in mind that we're going to do that. The next thing you need to do, a production schedule, it's a technical thing going into this, but bumping is basically where you bring everything into the event and set it up. Um, then you have your event run sheet, which is pretty obvious what happens during the event, and then bump out is where you get everything out. And production schedules are important because you have a limited amount of stuff that you can do during the event. If you've done your staff and delegation amazingly, great. More often than not, we have very limited resources, so we need to be perfectly organized with how we do our event. In the sample documents at the end of this, I've included um, an example of a bump out sheet, uh, sorry, a production schedule. Um, it's basically just times, who's responsible for things, what the things are, um, what kind of like leeway you have, any like special comments section, if it's like anything that someone's told you that you need to update, that kind of thing. Production schedules are really important but they're not very complicated. Right, so point 11 is your site plan. Um, this is something I realized about half an hour ago and just wrote it in there, so it's kind of crap. Um, basically, every event requires some kind of drawn out map, some measurement and a few reasons. So some events will require, the council will require that you need to have an approved site plan, which is like a temporary building permit kind of thing. Um, planning approval saying that your event is going to be safe within their conditions and they're prepared to let you do it. But even if that's not the case, say you're running an event in like a boardroom, um, they won't require you to have a site plan. The point I'm trying to make to you is that it is actually really important to do one no matter what you're doing. Because it, A, it helps you design the space to make your event better and make the things that you're trying to achieve actually work out. But also B, again, shit happens. Like something won't fit in the right spot, someone won't be able to walk in the right place. That kind of thing needs to be planned out and actually put into a plan, drawn out map. And maps, um, more often than not, can be drawn by hand if you're doing something that doesn't require like specific have specific requirements like council requirements and dabbing liquor maps. But um, it's good to be able to do it in Google Sketch and Photoshop and stuff because then you'll be able to more easily read it later, um, and it'll also be way more professional if you're trying to show a contractor this is what I want to do, that kind of thing. Um, and again, not everyone knows how to do that, so that might be something you actually need to get someone to do for you, just a friend who's good at graphic design, watch a tutorial, that's what I did on Google SketchUp, that kind of thing. Um, all right, now these last few things are things that like almost everyone forgets, and they're actually super important, um, and they're kind of like tips that I can give you from having done event before. So very important and often overlooked. You need to actually think about how you're going to deal with stress and how that's going to impact on your attitude. Event management is really stressful. Example today, me being sick. There's no way I could have got out of this, <laughs> even if I wanted to. Um, I have to turn up, I have to do this, and that's kind of something that would stress me out and make me not perform as well. So you've got to think beforehand, all right, stress is gonna be something I'm gonna to have to deal with. I'm gonna to need to give myself time to sleep. I'm gonna to need to give myself time to get between places. I'm gonna to need to ask for help. That's something you need to think about and write down beforehand. And that's why we did the delegation and staff plan, etc. Um, but also, more importantly, not really more importantly, but to other people more apparent, if you're someone who gets stressed at events, I've seen it happen all like a lot, especially with volunteer events, people will get stressed and then start putting out a bad vibe to people. And that very much is going against all of the hard work you've done. Even if something's super stressful, the police are coming, something really bad has happened, it's always going to be better for you and your event if you're at least giving the outward perception of calm and positivity. So if your 100 staff turn up and you just completely run off the ground and you have no idea what's going on, it's much better to stand there and smile and feel like you're gonna die on the inside than it is to like <laughs> sit down and be like, go away everyone, I need to do some work, kind of thing. It's something I've learned by experience. But yeah, it's something you need to consciously acknowledge before the event. How am I gonna do that? What am I gonna act like? How am I gonna think? Like, it's about being mindful. Am I gonna think about how other people are perceiving me? All right, um, important and often overlooked again, review. Now, this is actually kind of like the easiest thing to do that will make your event the most better. 
Um, English. So basically, it's actually about doing like a sitting, a sitting down, a written sitting works. Um, like plan for what you're going to do better next time, and acknowledgement of all the different things that you could have done better or that went well with your event. So an example is, I imagine Bloom's done it, but I can't talk about it. I've been involved in it for their launch event. Um, EMAS, every single time that we've run an event in the last four years, I think it is now, maybe three, we've had a big meeting at the end between the core people and individually and all of the big group and said, right, what are the key things that everyone noticed that could have been done better? What are people's perceptions? How are we going to fix those perceptions? How serious were they? Is there any room for error? Did, was it our fault? It's really, 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 really important, no matter what event you're doing, no matter what you're trying to achieve, and no matter who you are, that you actually consciously sit down, write down what you've done wrong and what you've done right, and then other people's perceptions of what you've done wrong and what you've done right. Because there's no point running an event if you're not going to be able to run a better event later on. There's no point doing something and putting all your hard work and time into it if you're not going to be able to build on that and get it better. I say written is better, but written is essential. Alright, now I'm going to go back over these things and just give you quick examples, just to make sure that everyone understands. So, I'm going to give away all EMAS's secrets, which is why they've come down to make sure that they're safe. Um, so yeah, Beat the Dark Side Festival, I'm very popular. Um, I beat the Dark Side Festival is basically a 2,500 person party that we're running on Oaklawn. Um, I think it's quite a, quite an impressive thing to do because it's very difficult to get the Indian elite to do that. Um, and there's a lot of other reasons, like people just being 18 and not having any idea how to do anything professional. <laughs> you know, the common things we deal with, but we managed to do them because we do these things. And I was very popular when I like started AMS kind of thing. I wasn't particularly experienced, and I certainly wasn't very talented. But um, doing these things and learning how to do them is how we, we managed to achieve it. And there are other people in the who are the same, very true for. So I hate that was not very talented either. And uh, <laughs> 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 Alright, so my mission statement when I ran the first Ibiza in 2012, um, which is by the way, I think like 300 or 500 people, it was a hurricane on the day, it was great. Um, my mission statement was I want to get people involved in this club because there's no one involved in this club and I want to create a culture in this club that's actually like fun. That's actually like kind of rewarding to be a part of the club. What research did I do? I spoke to a couple of people in the industry that I kind of knew. People I didn't know went up to them and say, hey, if they tell you to go away, you go away. Otherwise, you'll find that they're pretty helpful. Um, I looked on the internet at kind of like what big clubs and stuff were doing in WA. Um, events like Future Music, Stereo Sonic, tried to like scope out their info for their websites and stuff like that. So I did that research, I wrote all of that down. Um, I've got some pretty like screwed up text documents with like 10,000 words of just me writing down my ideas, uh, which were interesting to look at when I was writing this. Um, the fundamentals, I decided I wanted to do it at uni because um, it was for uni students and the best way to get uni students was involved was at uni. I decided I wanted to put it at this date because it's kind of when like, there's a bit of a break in the uni schedule, hectic exams and assignments and stuff like that. Um, by the way, if anyone has questions, feel free to jump up. Um, and the venue, I thought that the vibe was kind of a little bit of a sacrifice I was making, putting it in the rep courtyard. Don't really like that space, but at the same time, price, um, risk, those kinds of things came into my consideration of the venue. What partnerships was I going to build? I think the first one I hit up, like Jim Beam, um, because uni students having fun, alcohol is a part of that. Um, and support groups, uh, and I'm not telling you everything, I'm just going through it quickly. Support groups kind of thing, I hit up like a couple of my friends to get involved in helping me run the event. Staffing was obviously the club, contributors was anyone who could play at the event, like DJs and stuff, so that it gave the event something to actually present. Regulatory plan, um, I screwed that one up pretty badly actually on my first event, and uh, like I said, it's the hard one. Because um, it is very difficult to find out what you need to do to get approved. So for example, on that event, I think I um, woke up at like 6 a.m., realized that I hadn't booked any fencing, and the fencing was the thing that you needed. Um, <laughs> And I hadn't really drawn a very good site plan, I hadn't planned to pick up the booze, things like that. But more importantly, I hadn't contacted the Subiaco Council. So they turned up like four hours before the event and were like, oh, you haven't done anything, so you can't run this event. And they just did it anyway. <laughs> but um, <laughs> moving on from that, is, um, yeah, you need to have that written out. And the mistake that I made was that I hadn't actually written out a regulatory plan because I didn't have a need to do one. But now I do, and you do too. Promotion plan. 
Um, right, we're going to make a couple of Facebook posts. These are when we need to do them. The targets that I said we need to sell this many tickets to fit our budget and we'll be able to hire the things we want to hire. Um, your delegation and outsourcing. Um, we had a couple of people in the committee who actually could like make a sentence, some others didn't, um, and managed to get through that. Contract the list basically was part of the research to who provides what, things that I need. Um, the budget, yeah, I was a, again, I was the treasurer at that point, and uh, I was very good. Um, I just basically sat down with Microsoft and Excel, didn't know that there were things you could do, like formulas and stuff like that, uh, and just like added things together. It worked though, so again, like, you don't need to have a huge amount of experience. An overall timeline, pretty simple, did that on a calendar. Risk management, um, filled out the guild risk management plan, which is what we need to give you a copy of later, because it's, it's an okay example of what a risk management plan is. Um, and kind of like try to think about what the different risks were in terms of people tripping over, in terms of like drunk people getting into the venue, in terms of um, equipment failure, that kind of thing. Um, production schedule, um, simple. <coughs> a site plan, I drew that by hand. Um, I contacted the venue and they gave me the wrong site plan. And, yeah. Um, but it was important and I still have that. I'm glad I did it. Um, and then Getting your shit together was one that actually went really wrong, which is why I know it was really important. I got pretty stressed out, which is why these things haven't been done. Um, and I think the president of the group and I had a massive fallout because we were both stressed and we hadn't thought about how we are going to deal with our attitudes on the day. Um, important and often overlooked again, the review. That was something we actually did really well. So we sat down and said, what have we done well? What have we done wrong? Um, and we actually set aside an entire day of just brainstorming, sitting around, having like casual things. And we did it ourselves. We wrote down things we got to that and then we did it amongst each other and then we combined that with doing like a survey of all the other people who were there who'd gone to the event. My voice is giving that out. <clears throat> Alrighty. Now I was meant to give you an example of the one that we're doing this year, but basically it's just like a mess of the upscale version of that. So now I'm gonna do the frequently asked questions um, and I'm gonna go through topic by topic. If you have specific questions about any topic, then make sure you ask before I move on to the next slide. Um, I'm trying to get through a lot, so I'm screwed out. If you do need to apply for a liquor license, more often than not, yes, but if you're in a licensed premises, no. And there are certain exceptions, which are, if you're running an event less than 100 people for less than two hours, you don't need a liquor license. And if you're running an event for less than 75 people for less than four hours, you don't need a liquor license. Otherwise, yes, it's pretty simple. There are some like, very specialist things about like if you're running a business, can you provide your customers with liquor? The answer is yes, you can give them two drinks. But other than those things, these are kind of the things you need to know. And I'll give you the link if you want to look that up afterwards. Where do I get cheap booze? This is one that Julian Coleman asked me. I think it was kind of a self-interested question. Because he's a, he's an, um, alcohol, he works for an alcohol company that gives people free booze sometimes. Um, but basically there are three different um, things you need to think about. If you're running a smaller event, um, then fundamentally, you're not going to get cheap booze much cheaper than you can just go to Dan Murphy's, etc., etc., and get a couple of quotes and just do the smart thing, just comparing them and making sure that you're going to different ones according to what's going to be better for you. All right, large events, a um, couple of hundred drinks, um, that kind of thing. You can bargain a little bit more, you got a little bit more, um, you're giving them a little bit more money, so you can do that. Uh, you can attempt sponsorship. It's something that needs a lot of time, like months, like eight months, but it's something that if you want to know how that works, talk to me. And I put an example of a sponsorship document that I made up uh, in 2014 in the drive to share with you guys and that the head told me with, um, which will give you a good example of like what the things are you need to be saying to people to get something from a sponsorship. Community and charity events have a lot more leeway, and again, no, not again, but um, this really one really comes down to like how good you are at making personal connections, um, but also a little bit of research. Figure out the different liquor companies in Perth. If you want more information, ask me. Go into bottle shops, say, what do I need to do to get sponsorship from you? More often than not, bottle shops, it's kind of like three months before you need to fill out a form, tell them what your event's about, and they have a budget to support the community group. But if you're going through a liquor company, um, then there's a lot more to it. Uh, what do I do if, okay, that one's the wrong spot. I'll do that later on. Does anyone have any questions about liquor and what needs to be done to liquor? That's why I put that one first. Promo on ticket sales, um, a lot of people think this one's really difficult because they're worried about how popular their experience they are, etc, etc, but it's not, it needs to be portable, it needs to be some of the mistakes people make. What's the best way to do ticket sales? Something someone asked on the Facebook. The best way to do ticket sales is to stagger it, 
because a you want to be able to give yourself like some metric, a bit of a like quantifiable look at am I achieving my targets and getting people to come to the event kind of thing. And B, um, it's about creating that perception of demand. So more often than not, a company that's experienced in event management will make their first release of tickets quite small because then it sells out. And it means that there's a guaranteed number of people coming to the event and kind of mitigates their risk. But also it shows other people that there is demand for that event. So like EMAS does cheap tickets, a couple hundred tickets, because it tells them there are people coming and it tells people that people want to buy it. And then it also rewards people who are really invested <clears throat> and then you make them progressively more expensive and you play with the allocations according to your income projection. If you're worried about people not coming to your event, try to make the tickets as cheap as possible, of course. But better than doing that, better than selling like 100 tickets at $15, it'd be really good to sell like 20 tickets at $10 or $5 and then another lot at $10 and then another lot at $15 because it gives you the surety and it gives people the perception of the event. Right, be honest with yourself about your skills and knowledge in terms of promo. I'll oh, we'll go back to point two. This is what I was saying about if, if you think that you're good at something, make sure that you're good at something because um, a lot of people do really crack at promo. Um, and don't be scared to outsource. It can be like kind of hard to find a graphic designer. It can be kind of hard to find a friend who's willing to help you, but it's just something you need to do if you're not successful at it. Um, also, with decorations, don't let them be tacky. It's pretty easy to do. Ask for advice as well, um, and then another really good thing if you want to make sure that the stuff that you're doing is, is nice, um, is to look at what others have done. So research on Google, other event posters and stuff, I've given you some examples and look at what I thought were good posters. But, um, social media, obviously we live in the social media age, people don't seem to be able to talk to each other very well. Um, so put some actual time and planning into how you're going to manage your social media. So your promotion plan is not just about contacting other groups and people to be involved, like newsletters and stuff like that. It's also about um, saying what are the posts I'm going to make, how they're going to be interesting, what other people have done that actually gets people involved. Like running competitions is a really good example. Facebook really likes to push people's photos, Facebook's statuses. These are the things that you can learn by research, by talking to people, and just by putting a little bit of planning into your content. Um, Schedule and contract at the end of the time, okay, with the best formatting I'll talk about later. All right, um, if you're a small group and you're starting from scratch, a lot of people say, how do I get people interested and in, involved in running my event? How do I get people to actually come? Well, people aren't gonna come to your event just because of you. People are gonna come to the event because they know other people who are involved. And also, you don't know as many people as you probably want to if you wanna run a really successful event. No one's starting from like being a top level promoter. So what you want to do is you want to involve other people personally in the running of your event, in the organization, in your group. And that means getting a couple of people involved and saying, hey, like, would you like to help me run this event? Like, I think that you'd be really good at it. And you might have some fun and get something out of it. You might learn something. And then them being involved brings in a whole nother subset of people that they know, that they can market to. It brings in a whole nother like, set of resources that you can then allocate to your really important thing, which is getting people to come to your event. Etc. So a really good thing for small organisations is to try and get whoever they can get involved. And it's a skill. Uh, it's something that you learn. It's about being able to convince them to pitch to them what you want them to do. Um, friends and family are good people to ask for favours because that means you can have a bit more time to think about this stuff. Um, help advice. Now the stuff I was just talking about is kind of best thought about in terms of being a multiplier effect of involvement in ticket, ticket sales. The more people that are involved, the more friends they have, the more people they know, the more sales they'll go on. Yeah, pretty simple. Um, how do I make the most money from ticket sales? And that's at the end about projections. So it's about figuring what, what you want to allocate to where, thinking about the risks that you're taking with putting a certain number of tickets as a thing to achieve, how many are you going to do. That's simple, but yeah, you need to make sure that you make money from it, you need to know what you're dealing with in terms of how popular are these kinds of events. How like many people are going to these kinds of events in the places that I'm aiming for. What are my target audience like? It's research, fundamentally. That's how you make sure you like judge the man through that. Do anyone got any questions about like promo or ticket sales or anything related? Mm -hmm. Specific advice on social media? Yeah, um, it sounds crap, but be interesting. 
don't post things that will from other from the person's perspective you're marketing to won't be interesting. Um, and that again is about research, what other people have done. I can give you a, a list of my tips if you want. Yeah, use photos. Um, try and get original content. Don't just try and like, recycle cat photos because everyone does that. And honestly, it's so boring. I've deleted so many people off Instagram for that. Um, what are some other things? Um, videos are really good because videos are sh like shake things up a little bit. Um, it can be hard to get videos, but you can pretty simply learn to uh, work with that kind of thing. Um, some other tips for social media. Use different avenues of social media as well. Don't just fully rely on Facebook. Um, a lot of people don't interact with one social media as much as they do another, or they focus only on one, so you need to kind of spread the base. And that doesn't mean having like a company Twitter if you're going to be putting up like crappy posts about, hey, we just like added this new slight alteration to our product. What it means is that um, you're putting like interesting content into all of your different avenues according to what you think you can do. Um, things that people find really interesting are competitions. Um, or things that actually give a benefit for being involved in the post with. So Facebook is really good, and so is Twitter, at judging what they want people to see on Facebook and Twitter because they don't want Facebook and Twitter to be boring and they want people to use them. So Facebook will push things that have more likes harder, which is why you get a lot of those things in the news feed, which are kind of things you don't usually interact with, like random pages. But because they're so popular, people then get them pushed onto their timeline. So if you're posting, um, every now and then a boring status and every now and then a um, like funny photo that everyone likes or a competition, then that's kind of like a happy medium if you're trying to get people information. You need to be making sure that you have as much interest in all of your posts as possible kind of thing. Um, and then just balancing it. Is there anything else you want? Yeah, yeah, another thing that actually I think is a really good idea is um, don't put the same thing into every one of your social media. Spend a bit of time on it. It is a really big thing these days. Um, like, you shouldn't be having the same thing on your Instagram as is on your Facebook necessarily, sometimes, yeah. But, um, like, Instagram is its own thing. It has a very big centralization on, like, the aesthetic of the photo. Facebook is about more than that. It's about, like, community involvement. And, yeah. What's your <coughs> Can't hear it off. You have to shout. Are you asking the best time to put up statuses and things? Yeah. Yeah, um, that's something you can research really simply on Google. Um, I can't hear. You're talking about the content, like the amount of content in your Oh, the post. amount of content. Yeah. The best times to post things, in my experience, and it does slightly change over time in Facebook, people will have like their opinion that they think it's the best time to post this or time and another time. But um, having kind of like been involved with Facebook directly, one of the um, people in Emacs actually paid for um, lessons from Facebook. Um, the best kind of time is common sense when you think that most people will be on Facebook. And that is kind of like eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning, and then kind of like five o'clock, six o'clock in the night. It's as simple as that. That's Facebook. Um, the regularity of posting and things that you should do, you should be posting more than like three things a day, but it, again, it depends on what you're doing. Um, if you're a group that has lots of followers already and wants to get as much content out to people, you can afford to make three statuses a day. If you're a small group that doesn't want to be spamming people and for them to lose misinformation, you don't want to be putting out like lots of, of, of posts because like I said, the algorithms judge how successful your past things in, are in pushing the future things. So if you're doing like five posts a day and each of them gets like three likes, Facebook will just relegate you to the dustbin. If you do one every now and then, like every three days, that people actually like, you'll get a lot more out of it. Yeah. This question was about the length of the post. Like oh, and about the length of the post? The, length Sim the smaller the better. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Matt? No, I was just going to. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah, Ian, I've got a question. Um, in terms of, um, um, if you have a liquor license, right, you have a um, number of people that can go into the venue. And then um, how many toilets you need uh, for, the, for the size of the venue and also free managers. How about if your venue is not licensed? Like is there, like do, do we have any OH&S obligations? Yeah. 
Um, well, and like for example, we could have private space, like for example, if I host a party at my house, um, does the law still apply in terms of like torts? Like, um, obviously, not even torts, criminal law applies. It doesn't apply, but do I still have a duty of care to ensure that um, electrical wires, people might be tripping over that or? Yeah. Well, yeah, obviously there's, there's a common sense and like legal common sense in terms of like your obligation to people never to be negligent and do things which are obviously putting them at risk, like electrical cables and stuff like that. Um, depending on the event, different regulations apply. In the Google Drive, I've put something that is very complicated but tells you absolutely everything you need to know. It's like 100 pages of all the different regulations. There's also the building codes, um, which are like Australia-wide. Then there's also like the local council regulations. And then there's also like the criminal law applies now because there's the out of control parties amendment to the criminal code, um, which says that you've got more than, I don't know, like I think it's 20 people in your house and it gets reported that it's out of control, which is like a big, no one really knows what that means yet because not many people have been charged with it, then you can get in trouble. Um, what I'm trying to say is that it depends on your event. It's more, it's not so much about memorizing everything absolutely everything that you need to do. It's more about the mindset and following the steps that I put in there, about talking to the venue, finding out what their requirements are, talking to the council, finding out what their requirements are, talking to, if you're gonna get a liquor license to the government, finding out what their requirements are. Even if you're not running an event that has a liquor license, more often than not, you'll have to have registered with the council and they'll give you a capacity. And if you're running an event in a venue, then they'll tell you you can't go over capacity. And if you go over those capacities, the common sense you're doing the wrong thing. And if, if there's a stampede and stuff like that, people all the time run events where that happens and they get in trouble. Um, is there anything more you want me to talk about in that? Okay. It's about being careful as well. No matter what list of things that I give to you, not, not every risk will ever be able to be said, oh, these are all the risks that you can take into account. This is the number of toilets you need. Everything comes down to different events, but it's about being careful and learning what you need. Would you follow the same steps if you were um, hosting like your 21st as opposed to IV Club? Yeah, yeah. Like, you probably wouldn't be bothered with a couple of them, um, like a promotion plan and stuff like that. But yeah, no. Nah. Having run my 21st like two years ago, I think it is now, it's depressing. Um, <laughs> yeah, you kind of like. You, when you've done event management, I'm sure you'll find it as well. Matt, Matt's the event manager of Matt's the moment, by the way. Um, then, yeah, you follow those steps like subconsciously. What I've tried to do is give you a list of things to write down so that you're actually making sure you address each of them and are careful and mindful of the overall process. Yeah. Um, I think we don't have much time. One more question. Yep. Let's say if I'm running a quick event, how can I make sure that people will show up? Like, is it better to charge them question. tickets so that people will come? Um, it depends what kind of free event. So she asked, if I get a free event, how do I get people to come? Because obviously you can't necessarily like give off that impression of demand in, in the ticket way. Yeah. So, so what kind of event? Running an exhibition. Right. You're running an exhibition. Yeah. All right. Um, if you go through the list, it'll kind of bring up different points that'll help you. The, the twelve point list. The things off the top of my head that'll help you. You want to have a good contributor and delegation plan and like a staff plan. And what I said about the multiplier effect, getting as many people involved. It also applies to contributors, um, making sure that you've got quality content that people are demanding kind of thing in your, in your art presentation. Um, giving the perception of demand, you don't need to sell tickets to do that. Like if you're not trying to get 30, 100 people or whatever at your event, um, then it comes down to just showing people that it's gonna be a good thing, making people like stuff on Facebook, um, like run a competition for people attending. Yeah, there are, there are steps you can take. You just need to sit down and be methodical about each of those steps. What am I going to do in the perception of creating demand and trying to get people to come? And if you want more effort than that, we can talk about it then afterwards. Yeah. Anyone got any more questions about promo? Because there's a couple more things to go through. Cool. Budgeting. A couple of people asked about it on Facebook, so I thought I'd make these points. Um, use an adaptive template if possible, which is why I've given you one. Um, and it, that one is for a fictitious event, so just keep on the numbers. Um, aim for accuracy, but don't hesitate to overestimate the costs and underestimate the revenue. Same thing as the buffer I talked about with time. Always good to plan to, you know, fail before you actually do get anywhere close to failing. Um, another good thing that I find really useful is um, putting an upper limit and a lower limit. So kind of saying, what's my best case scenario? What's my worst case scenario? If I only sell 1,500 tickets instead of 2,000, what would be my revenue figure, and then what are the things that I need to do to cut 
from my spending so that I don't lose a crap load of money. Um, and then your best case scenario lets you know what are the options that we can do if we were absolutely going crazy with money. Um, try and sort someone else's budget or ask around. Again, it's about research, it's about kind of having a context to what you're doing. Budgeting, it isn't a special skill, it's just about kind of knowing all of the other stuff and being able to feed that through a methodical, well thought out budget. How do I make sure I make lots of money? That's a good question. Um, the, the way to do that is um, do the cost, the high cost, um, low income thing, do the best case, worst case, and then over the course of using the budget and um, and updating it with your receipts and things like that, review your budget. So you probably at the beginning of running your event won't know how much something costs necessarily. You put an estimate. You need to make sure you update that estimate because. Very often things will change dramatically. You'll find out you have to pay like a thousand dollar liquor license fee, that kind of thing. Um, and you need to be making sure that you go over your budget in like a holistic review and saying, all right, maybe I need to change the next ticket price that I release because it looks like I'm not actually making as much money as I need to pay for the things that I'm gonna get. So that's one way that you can kind of like duke your budget um, to make lots of money. Um, yeah, um, how do you get sponsorship? Um, Firstly, the most important thing is you need to know who would kind of sponsor you. So it's about research, it's about talking to people who've run events before and finding out who they got to sponsor them. Um, one thing I found useful when I was doing sponsorship was looking at what other like WA clubs have been sponsored by, um, asked friends of mine who've been presidents and stuff, like have you got any letters that you've written to them that I can see for how you've done, and stuff like that. Um, come to the Bloom out of pitch presentation and stuff like that. There, there are methodical steps you can take. Um, write, write a couple of letters, it's as simple as that. Write letters just asking people, because more often than not, someone's gonna say no straight away than like, because you've not given them enough information. If you get in contact with someone and you actually get the conversation going, you've got a much better chance of actually getting somewhere than if you don't get that conversation going. And then you've gotta balance that against how professional am I gonna be, how much effort am I gonna put into my sponsorship perspectives? Or am I just gonna go out and talk to someone? You gotta balance that professional professionality against like getting the conversation started and actually getting it done. But it's an important thing to consider that you actually need to get it done. And just, just write a letter and it should work. Um, if you have time, get a graphic designer and put it through InDesign. Um, and if you have time, write a sponsorship perspective document like the one I wrote for EMS, which is in the um, in the drive. Um, yep. Big one, how not to screw up. Um, if you can set deadlines a few hours or days before they need to be like done. So if you've got a contractor bringing in a stage or something like that, or bringing in the food, um, you want to make sure that if it's possible, it's done a couple of hours before it needs to be done. Because again, remember the shit happens. Um, deadlines, the big important thing I said about that big calendar, make sure you give yourself off a time between the day that something actually needs to be submitted and the day that you're going to have it ready to be submitted. Um, Second thing, give yourself realistic amounts of time to get stuff done. You actually need to think what is going to be involved in you getting something done. Don't just be optimistic like I do sometimes and say, I might get like my entire assignment done by Sunday, even though it's due in three months. You need to be realistic about like, how am I actually going to fit this into my life? Because putting those times on the thing isn't just about figuring out when there's deadlines, it's about actually figuring out how long it's going to take to do, when am I going to be able to get it on there at the earliest time before it needs to be submitted. And factor in obviously work, eat, sleep, because people do forget to do that. Um, if you can afford it, or if you plan to have more resources than you need, that means more stuff, more electrical cables, more food, more drinks, and sometimes you can return drinks to the place you bought them from. Um, have a phone charger, have food for yourself, have like something as simple as like a hairbrush and a phone charger in your bag. Um, because if you have those things available to you and you're, you're ready, even if shit happens, you're kind of prepared, or you're more prepared. You won't be as stressed, you won't be as grumpy. Um, and also, you be able to get things done. Actually do the risk management plan, that's a big thing. Because like, not many people actually write it down, um, unless they're going to be forced to do it. And even if they do have to do it, a lot of people won't actually think about it. I've been guilty of that in the past. They just rewrite the same one every time. But it's really important in actually making sure that you mitigate your own risks, that you actually acknowledge them, serious about them, you don't have to tell other people necessarily what's in your plan, but it's, it's a really important thing to consciously actually know what to do. Um, and you need to include everything in there, like even crazy stuff, like um, there being a fire and needing to evacuate the venue or something equivalent to that. Um, and everything silly, everything small down to like not enough attendees. Just little things that are obvious, but you should put them on there and think about how I'll actually do it.
don't over decorate. Um, yeah, some people make their events look crap just by putting up like 30,000 tiny paper letters or something like that. Um, when they could have just paid for like one big archway at the front or something like that. Um, don't over decorate, do things big, smaller but bigger and more impressive, less tacky. Therefore, controlled explosions, um, it especially applies to social media, but it applies to everything, it's about your attitude. Um, prepare for things to go wrong, how are you gonna deal with them? And when they go wrong, it's about mitigating it, not about just like, oh crap, it's gone wrong. So if someone posts a negative comment on your Facebook, um, you need to say to them in a positive way, like, we're sorry this happened to you, because this is something that happens all the time. Nicola made a good point about this in her speech. Um, you need to kind of like respond to them with positivity and kind of like break that risk down, make the explosion controlled so it's not as bad for you, instead of it just being something that's left out there that everyone sees. And another really bad thing to do is delete them. I've seen events that haven't gone well. Um, then have the person running them delete all of the bad posts on the event. And um, oh, if you got like completely abusive off the planet ones, then yeah, sure. But if there's people just like making legitimate complaints, it's gonna do a lot more for your brand to be honest with them and stand up to them and say, this is why this happened and this is what we're gonna try to do to fix it for you and we're really sorry than it is to just completely delete it. Because people know that, that your things have been deleted, people will post, it's been deleted, that kind of stuff. But controlled explosions goes into everything. If there's an evacuation, you need to be ready for it. Um, licensing, you can probably read this one yourself, there's a lot to it. Basically, it's just talk to all of those people, and then you'll be in the best situation to know what you actually are required to submit, um, and know what your obligations are. Um, and I don't want to tell you these are your obligations for every event, because there are so many different things that can happen, so many different people you might need to talk to, so many different types of events. But if you go through these steps and if you've got forgotten any, then bring them up. Um, then you'll have the best chance of knowing what it is that you need to do and what you need to do it by. And then there's a couple of specific ones like testing and taking your electrical cables and stuff, which is generally they're just things that you just need to do everywhere. All right, open questions. I have two more slides that I'll just show you what they are. So that's like a list of some of my preferred suppliers. I pretty much wrote down every every kind of thing we might need for them. Um, there's another one of that. Uh, that's the link to the Google Drive. You get a copy of this. Um, I'll be adding a couple more things in the, into the hour after this. Um, but it's got like a lot of different things in folders there that you'll find helpful. None of it is confidential. Um, and most of it's just like examples. So again, like probably some of them will be hard to like just rip into your, into your thing, but use them as guidance for what you need to be doing. Like the promotion plan, you can change the days and stuff like that. And then we're done. And I've given you a list of things. Um, basically, this slideshow will be available through Bloom. I don't know how. Susan, how will it be available? Susan's not paying attention. How will the slideshow be available for everyone here if they want it? Um, we'll upload it to the um, main page. Okay. Um, and I think they've got a YouTube channel where they post a speech. Um, and then if you're good if you've got this, these slides, because you probably don't remember everything I said today, and a lot of it isn't actually useful. Um, if you want more info, or you want me to look over your plans, or you want any kind of help, um, then I'm like really happy to, um, really, really happy to. Uh, and then, then my contact details. If you found this useful, chuck me a like on my page. I haven't published it yet, but I'm like getting toward publishing it. Um, and come to our event. But before we finish, does anyone have any, I know we're like half an hour, but does anyone have any like, Questions about absolutely anything that they can't talk to me about afterwards. What's up? Um, how would you go about tagging <coughs> on someone else's event? How would you go about what? Tagging on to someone else's event. Yeah. Like what kind of event are you talking about? Um, so, in, let's assume it's a business and a trade show. So, how would you go about tagging on to well, First of all, I wouldn't do anything without asking. Like, if I've seen people run like unofficial pre-parties and post-parties to other people's events and things like that, and then get in a lot of trouble for it. Um, second of all, um, how would you tag onto it? Are you asking how would you do it, like, in a way that gets some success from the other event, or? Yeah, so how would you, you how would you, uh, how can you work with another event to help promote your event? 
drumming business or promoting an event that you're doing, yeah. or go to that other event with that permission. Well, there are a couple of very practical and simple things. Go to the event, talk to the people at the event, find out who they are, what they do, how you're going to be able to get in contact with them in the future to sell them your event. Um, meet the people who run the event, see if maybe you could potentially hire them to run your event, see if you can get on the stage and talk in a microphone about your event in some way by sponsoring them or something like that. Yeah, pretty simple little things you just need to write down in your maybe in your promotion plan about what you're gonna what events you're gonna go to. Like when people run for president, they don't just go, Oh, I'm gonna go talk at everything for between now and, and when I actually get elected president. They write down these are the things that are happening, these are the things that I'm gonna do, these are the things I'm gonna push at those events, these are the people I'm gonna try and like partner up with, you know what I mean. Yeah, put that in your promotion plan. And else got any questions? Cool. All right, thank you very much for coming. I hope you could hear me and everything like that. Thank you. All right, thanks for coming, guys. Next week, we've got Design and Branding by Mara from Tinderbox Creative. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback about this event or any other event, so it's bloom.org.au slash feedback. If you haven't followed us on Facebook yet, um, follow us, uh, otherwise, um, We've also got uh, Instagram, which is bloom.wa, and we've also got a YouTube channel. Cool. Um, just one other thing, uh, actually two more things. Um, we've also got a masterclass that we're running um, on this Saturday um, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, run by the co-founder of Student Edge, which is a really big student um, organization that has like something like 750,000 members. So he started as a student. Um, has now been very successful and he's going to be teaching people through the first couple of steps along being an entrepreneur. So you can find that event also um, on, our, on our Facebook page. Make sure that you like Bloom um, for more of these sort of things. Um, and also if you are actually just about just starting or maybe you, you've had a business for a little bit but you need some extra support, um, please uh, get in contact with us about becoming a member of the actual space. Um, we have about 40 young entrepreneurs that work out of this space at the moment, and we just want to see that grow and grow. What we can provide is the space for free, um, also a connection to about 70 mentors that we have, um, experienced entrepreneurs and consultants, um, and yeah, we run a whole heap of other, we, yeah, we can do a whole heap of other stuff to support you as well. So um, yeah, get in contact with us if you'd like to become a member. And thank you so much for coming today.